Nice to see y'all. Are you going back? Okay. Don't have the joke for the day. Sorry. Yeah. No, I think you, I figured you'd go, yay. All right. No jokes to suffer through today. But if you got your Bibles, no joke. Second Chronicles chapter 9. You go, what? Yes, Chronicles. That's the Old Testament, not the New. It's not Corinthians. It's Chronicles. No, I actually had a blonde one time, thought it was corn. Uh, seriously, that's no joke either. Uh, but it's Corinthians, but we're not there yet. But we're going to start over here in Chronicles. Look a lot alike if you're a little dyslexic. Second uh, Chronicles chapter 9. And I really appreciate you coming out today in the middle of this lovely weather we're having. But hey, we could be like, you know, in snow and ice, right? Nice winter. And how about them gas prices? Wow. All right, we got plenty to be happy about. If you will, let's pray, okay? God and Father, I do give you thanks today, and I bow before you humbled, Lord, um, to stand in front of anybody, let alone these folks that have come out to make up a church. God, uh, as we come, we, I'm thankful that we share the common bond of recognition that, um, God, we don't come because we know so much. We come because we don't know enough, but we do know enough to know Jesus that, man, we seek to find the God that created us, and we seek to find out our purpose in life. And we seek to find a little rhyme to the reason and a little meaning to the madness that uh, oftentimes life deals us. And this year, as we've tried to take a look at things that uh, don't make sense from a worldly perspective, we find out more and more, God, that in you, if we see with faith instead of the tangible things of this earth, that uh, even in these things, the things that go well and the things that don't go so well, God, you're in the middle of it and you can use it. Our faith isn't because we always see it always works out. It's because we trust you, Jesus, that you said you would work all things to the good if we'd love you and uh, we'd be called according to your purpose. God, I'm thankful for people that are here that I've known for years now, that you not only crossed my path but my heart with them, and that they've truly helped me, Lord, just as your word promises, to seek you and reach out for you and find even more of you. I'm thankful that many of them have invited their friends and families and uh, in that, God, that I've got a chance to meet them. And in that, Lord, that there are people that are seeking, in spite of being injured by churches, and, Lord, uh, smart enough to look and roll their eyes at the inconsistencies that they would try again. And I just pray, Lord, as a church, that we might not fail you or them. That as they seek, that we would hold up you, Jesus, and in the midst of our weakness, you'd be our strength. That we wouldn't pretend that we're sinless. But, God, that we would become a people that sin less than we used to. And that in the midst of it, Lord, that we don't glorify ourselves or excuse our sin, nor do we let it overwhelm us, because, Jesus, we trust that you've paid it all. So today, as we get together, Lord, on this dreary day on the outside, I thank you for the warmth of smiles and love and hugs, the greeting time, Lord, that was just shared, the singing time, God, that, uh, and music, how cool it is, but how much greater it is when we can put great words to music that adore you and worship you and help us to, Lord, cleanse our minds with the truth. Now, as we go to your word, Lord, in spite of my inabilities, in spite of, Lord, my feeble nature and my weakness, I pray, Jesus, for you to be strong in that weakness, for your grace to come through, and especially those that know me best, to realize, Lord, when there's things that are being said through my mouth that are so far beyond me that, God, it must be you, and that your delight is, Lord God, to speak to each and every one of us. And so I pray that today, no matter who's come, knowing them for years or not at all, God, that they would hear something today that would be you tapping them on the shoulder, staring them in the face, not, Lord, in anger, not with the finger out or anything that way in their face trying to tell them or scold them, but rather instead, Lord, with your arms open wide to compel them, that you're clearly aware of every one of us and where we're at. And, Lord, you want to be in the middle of it with us and that you will see us through. And, God, to the end, that we get to spend the longest portion of what real life is, eternity, with you because of all that you've done for us, Jesus. So we pray these things and ask that you would uh, just let us, let your presence be known, Lord, as you have already in many of our lives. Might we know you even more in Jesus' name. Amen. This um, teaching lesson, sermon, whatever it is that uh, I wish to share with you today is not anything that I can begin to wrap my arms totally around and so bear with me in my weakness. But um, at the same time, we've been looking at the book of Ecclesiastes and in it, uh, some of the things that were said there in the book of Ecclesiastes is from the preacher or the teacher. It wasn't me, but it's Solomon. And it's Solomon that was an individual and a man that uh, 
God had spoken to his dad before he was even born and told David that there would be somebody that would always be on his throne. In the midst of that, that what God spoke to him wasn't just that, but even where he would come from. And the amazing thing is, is and we touched on it at the beginning of the year, but just want to remind you again about where Solomon came from, that uh, it, it was out of this relationship that was ungodly, unholy, a relationship that happened in the midst of God blessing David with, with strength and with might with uh, victory over the enemies and uh, just an uncanny ability and this this little shepherd guy that uh, turned around and defeated Goliath and then turned around and then was the enemy of Saul and going back and forth within that conflict of the one that really was king had already been anointed by the prophet and yet David did nothing to advance his own case but rather instead humbly waited but kept adoring God he wrote many of the Psalms including the ones that we oftentimes read at funerals and all like the 23rd Psalm uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I really like uh, reading it from a standpoint of when the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because I oftentimes want a lot of different things. But when God's my shepherd, I realize how much I have. I've been humbled the last few, or over the last month, with the guys group that has started meeting and the prayer time there. And to hear, gr hear grown men talk about the fact of, God, I'm sorry for the years I've wasted in my life. But Lord, if you'll use me now, I'll try to make that up to you. God, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, you had to take so many things away from me, but I thank you that in taking them away, I began to see of what all I have. And those are cool prayers, folks. And they happen, and they happen with humble hearts like David had. So David defeated Goliath. David served at the behest of the king, both with the heart but also as a warrior. David defeated the Philistines, and David then ran for his very life, but David continued to trust God. And there was a day then when Saul was killed, the king, the first king of the Jews was killed. And David took that place, not because he exalted himself, but the people did. And through God, they brought him up and God ordained him as a king. David knew much joy and still to this day to the Jewish people that, that still read the word and, and observe the law, uh, even though they don't yet believe in Jesus. But uh, they still adore David as being the king of their kings, that he was the best ever. And they've never had what was known in that time of David's reign. They've never had that same cohesiveness and love and joy. I mean, David was one of these that he even gave gifts to the people as the temple of God, or not the temple, but the ark of God was carried in. Because you see, David wasn't just content that the ark of God existed. What David really wanted was to live next to God. And so he brings this ark in, and there's stories of that. And you go, well, why are we talking about David? I thought it was Solomon. Because David was the one that led the, the way into God bringing about Solomon. But in the midst of all these grand things that David did, suddenly and the thing that oftentimes the only thing that he's known for outside of Goliath is that he went ahead and although he slayed a giant, he was slayed by a giant. He was slayed by a giant of lust. And David gave in as he was, when the men went off to war, David didn't go with them this time. What David did was he hung back and in the midst of his idle time, he looked across from his palace roof and saw on the another roof a lady that was bathing. He didn't just see her, but he watched. And in the midst of watching, saw her beauty. In the midst of seeking her beauty, sought to have audience with her, and he brought her into his house. The part that really made it extreme was that her husband, Uriah, was off to war. So here was a man faithful to his wife and faithful to his king and to his God, out fighting for the sake of that kingdom. And yet David, on the other hand, wasn't fighting and he wasn't fighting enough even of his own desires. Instead, he gave in. And in giving in, brought her to his house. And in doing so, he made love with her. But like so many of the soap operas and different things of life happen, and even in everyday human, pe or human beings' lives today, a pregnancy happened. And this is where David then took one sin and he compounded it with others. In the midst of this pregnancy, and they didn't have a local clinic that they could go to like today to get an abortion. There was no way just to do away with it. So what David sought to do was instead to create a way or a, a scheme that uh, he could be able to be made to look like the hero. And so he brought Uriah home from the battle line and um, Uriah was told to go home and sleep with his wife. And he wouldn't because he said, how can I do that when my fellow comrades are out there on the battlefront? How can I turn around and do such a thing to, to, for my kingdom or against those men? He said, no. And so he slept at the doorway not with his wife, but instead on guard like a soldier. Since that didn't work, then the next thing that David did was he took his power and he ordered this king, or as a king, excuse me, he ordered as a king for his commanders to go ahead and put Uriah up at the front of the battle to go up to the city that they were trying to take and then 
I couldn't believe this. But all the good stuff David did and the beautiful song. But then what he did was he told him to go up there and then all the other men should withdraw. And he took advantage of this loyalty of Uriah, of fighting and of being a warrior and focused on the battle and he didn't even realize he no longer had anybody behind him. And sure enough, like David had hoped and planned, Uriah was killed. Well, then he sinned again. Because now not only did he conspire and did he truly murder, and did those that of obeyed him they didn't really have a lot of choice you could say but they did but as they obeyed him they turned around then and what david did next was he announced in some kind of a conspicuous way poor poor bathsheba let me bring you into my home why don't i come and take care of you because one of my fierce warriors was killed in battle now i don't know how many wives david would have had if he took everybody's wife that was killed in battle but you see it was a guilt complex but it was also a good way to cover up the sin because people wouldn't have known exactly how many months had happened and transpired and we all know that births can come early and sure enough they had a child that was born to them now the story continues to unfold and I don't share this in a way that I'm trying to dump dirt on David I share it in a way to show you that here we are you know almost 2700 to 3000 years later and stuff still happens it's why in the book of Ecclesiastes we write we read there's nothing new under the sun there's still people that get into trouble, still people that instead of fighting for God, end up giving in to the devil. There are still people that even though they love God, they do bad things. There are still people that conspire and that do things to assassinate other people in their lives. Although we know better, we do. But what David did then was really uh, inconspicuous to the world and may have been made to look like a hero, hero, but he was very conspicuous to God. And so as Dave, God looked down upon David, he finally couldn't stand it any longer. And he sent the prophet to him. He waited in what's believed to be about a two-year period of time for David to come to grips with what he had done. And as a godly man to confess to God his sin. And David wasn't. And so God, just like he does with us, he waits and he waits, patiently waits. He tries to set up scenarios and situations that we would come and not live with our sin, but to get rid of it, to confess it and to be free. But man, some of us, we just won't give in because we still think we can cover our own up. I've got good news for you. That's what the blood of Christ was designed to do, was to cover up sin. And to the church, I speak today as well, that it's vital that we stay in that business. Not me, not you covering up our own sin, but making sure that at the same time, we're not trying to expose other people's sin. And by that, I'm not saying that we shouldn't speak up if there's a wrong being done. But it's not our job to go tell everybody else in the world what so-and-so did and the, uh, to try to diffuse the effect of what we've done. But instead, we should be bringing people to Christ to let them be able to have their sins cleansed and forgiven, just as we should go. And if you can't do it, then bring somebody else in with you to go and make that confession to God. Directly to the Father through Jesus Christ, if he's been accepted and received as your Lord and Savior. Well, David sent, or God sent, excuse me, Nathan the prophet. And Nathan told the story to get David's attention about a guy that had gobs of sheep and one man that had a little lamb. And it wasn't Mary, it was a little guy, it was a guy with a little sheep, you know, just one of them. And how that this guy that was rich had a friend come over and he went over and stole that man's single sheep and he slaughtered him to provide a meal for his friend. David being a shepherd, being wealthy on his own and understanding the law of the land and, you know, the, the property boundaries and everything like that rushed to judgment and immediately said that man deserves to die and that's when nathan goes and david you're that guy and he let david know that god knew that's one difficult thing for us isn't it to comprehend that god knows everything although we kind of know it because inside we try to shield ourselves against it isn't it amazing how like a football player running with the ball we can hold on to our sin and I don't know what the goal line is we're rushing toward but we hold on and we stiff arm all those people that God tries to do not to bring us down but to bring us to repentance we stiff arm God and his voice and we can't hear it it's like the warning lights on on a, uh, a busy highway telling us that you know look out look out and we go straight ahead I actually saw a deal where a guy driving a very, very expensive car, a sports car, that uh, ignored the warning signs and he thought he would go right on around the construction site because, you know, hey, I've got the power of the wheels, let's just, boom, and he goes on around and didn't realize that what he just drove into was fresh cement. And uh, his car was like, you know, up over the floorboards, you know, because he, whoo, and I thought, what a mess. But that's what we do. God puts up the warning signs, we blow right on by them. And, and so David did up until that point and he comes to a screeching halt and he realizes and then he confesses. 
And Nathan goes on and he tells him, he said, God's forgiven you. And I hope that as a church we never lose that. But I hope in the midst of it we also never lose the truth because you see, confession is no good without the truth. Repentance is no good without the truth. And forgiveness of sin doesn't come without the confession and the repentance. And I, I don't mean that as a work, but it's that brokenness that comes before God that brings about His mercy, that the mercy was there and God's waiting. And God doesn't want to have to point out all of our sins. That's why He warns us ahead of time that there's coming a judgment day. And in that judgment day, that we'll give an account for deeds done while in the body. That there'll be a judgment of the wicked, but there'll be a judgment of the righteous. And it's not because God wants to expose. It's why he said, you know, get it out before me, you know. Share it so that you can live a free life, so that you can get beyond it, because sin has its way of tying us down. But in the midst of offering the forgiveness of God, Nathan the prophet went ahead and said, but there's one other thing God told me. The child that born, was born to you will die. And one of the coolest passages in 2 Samuel chapter, it's 11 and 12 area there. I'm sorry, I didn't take time to go to it, but... But in it, where David wrestles with God and he prays and prays, but the child dies. And it's this classy verse that comes through there that David, you know, the servants, once the child dies, David looks and he sees the servants. He said, what's happened? What's happened? He said, well, your, your son died. And David got up from the ground and he went ahead and took a shower and cleaned up and shaved and asked for him to prepare a meal. And his servants are looking around and they're going, this is weird. And David sees him whispering again. He said, what's up? He said, well, excuse me, sir, but we don't get it. While the child was alive, you spent week, day and night on your face before God, fasting and praying. Now the child's dead and you just get up and you go to eat and it's like, no big deal, let's go on. We're just kind of startled by that. And David goes, no, you don't understand. I can't bring my child back, but I can go see him. And what a classy way to realize that in spite of sin, that there was forgiveness. And in spite of how Satan must have stuffed that in his face. And with the death of his child, the guilt and all, David realized that God didn't take my life because there's still more for me to do. And I offer that to every one of us that's here today, that man, God is not aware of, or unaware of your sin. He's not saying, oh, no big deal, that's not a bad sin. No, it's all bad. It's all harmful to you. And what God hates is the fact of how sin drags us down. But in the midst of it, he still offers this compelling nature or voice of, hey, confess it, get rid of it, come on. And there's more to do. Some of us get overwhelmed at that and we don't want to go on. But God's saying, no, I've kept you alive for a reason. Move on with it. Take this now and pick up and go because with me, we can do it. And it's a beautiful message throughout the Bible about that and how God doesn't wink at sin, but he brings an end to it when we bring it to him. And so David picks up and he goes on. But I'm sure, just like me, just like any of you that have a conscience, that, that sin haunts you. And it's there and Satan reminds you. And faith turns around and says, but God, but God. And what happened next then, or in the midst of it, was David's design and desire to build a temple. And in the midst of his planning, and like some of us know what that's like to wake up in the middle of the night, you get this idea and you can't sleep, and so you begin plotting and planning and putting it together, because what was in David's heart after this feeling of forgiveness, not the next day or anything, but in time, David suddenly got his wheels back, got his air back in his lungs again, and the Spirit was leading him, and, and David just had this great idea. He said, man, what am I doing living here in a house with paneled walls? I guess he was in a trailer maybe. You know, they had paneling out there, whatever. Not that there's anything wrong with the trailer. We've lived in two of them. Uh, but, you know, he lived in this house. He goes, here I am living in the splendor with these paneled walls. And the ark of God's out there in a the tent. And so David had this great idea. He goes, man, God, I want to design a temple that would be fitting of you, my God and my king. Greater than the palace that I live in. And so that's what David began to plan. And, man, it was extravagant. And God in the midst of it, I don't know if he burst his bubble or just brought him down to reality. Like many of us, we have these great dreams and we think we know how it's going to turn out. And so we imagine ourselves hitting that home run with two outs and two strikes and the bases loaded to win the game, you know. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. But God said, David, he said, uh-uh. He said, I can't have you build the temple. I'll take your plans and I love your ideas, but it wasn't necessary. I mean, can you really build a building that I could be contained in? Well, no, God, but I want the world to know how much I think of you. And God was honored by that, but what he said is, you've been a man of blood and a man of war. 
And not only had David killed people, but David also had killed a man. And God's not bringing that back against him. He's just saying, this isn't going to be the best. But what I will do is, I'll let one of your sons build that temple. And the amazing thing was, of all the wives that David had, the wife that God picked to have the child that would build the temple was Bathsheba. And I could stop right there, because it's not an unbelievable story. Of God taking sin and wrong and turning around in the midst of a loss of an innocent child's life and an innocent man's life, bringing it back around and God showing the fullness of his forgiveness and his willingness to use David and his sin and his sinful relationship, but from that to now bring about something that would be good. And David said, or God told David of this son Solomon there, that he will rule for as long as he's alive, that he will be the ruler of the kingdom. He'll maintain it and I'll bless him. And then Solomon comes along, and i kind of trying to Reader's Digest this, believe it or not, but, but he comes along. And uh, Solomon had a humble enough heart that when he did get the temple built, and he did ordain it, and the Spirit of God came in and filled it, that uh, Solomon had a heart and a desire, and he prayed for the people, and he prayed for himself, and he asked God for wisdom. He asked God for wisdom to lead his people, to be able to keep them to be godly people great prayer and God answered it not only did he give him wisdom in that regard he gave him wisdom beyond that he made him the wisest man in the world and on top of that he made him the wealthiest man in the world because Solomon didn't ask for wealth but God gave it to him and so here in second chronicles chapter 9 we read a little bit about that actually in verse well yeah chapter 9 we'll just start with verse 1 but I mean it tells about it earlier than that and the whole dedication of the temple and it's all good and hard to leave any of it out but I want to just read this chapter 9 and you look at it and go oh man we'll be here all day man we could be but what are you going to do go have a picnic today uh, so 2nd Chronicles chapter 9 I want you to see what God chooses to do um, with this Solomon guy when the queen of Sheba don't know her but she was a queen not even certain where Sheba is and everybody's got their ideas but the queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame she came to Jerusalem from a purpose she came to test him with hard questions she'd heard about him thought I'll see how smart this guy is just like a woman I'll just see how smart this guy is I'll bet he doesn't know as much as he thinks he knows well so she comes and she goes to test him arriving with a very great caravan with camels carrying spices large quantities of gold and precious stones and and I mean we're talking about large quantities because this is the queen of Sheba coming to see the richest man in the world and so she brings all this stuff she came to Solomon. She talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Now, you talk about a long conversation. Uh, all that she had on her mind. I've been wanting to tell you. And, uh, you know, you can just imagine, you know, this, this lady, maybe she's uh, like a queen. She, like the kings had several wives. Maybe she had several husbands. She's going to tell Solomon about all of them. But she comes and she talks and says everything that's on her mind. Verse 2, Solomon answered all of her questions. Whoa! And read this. I mean, this is, this is amazing. Nothing was too hard for him to explain to her. I wish we had a Solomon around, man, at times like that, don't you? To be able to understand the speak stuff, the blue speak and the pink speak, you know, and to be able to translate and put it together. But uh, so she comes and Solomon answers all of her questions. Nothing's too hard. Not only did he answer, they weren't yes and no's, but he explained them to her, all right? When the queen of Sheba saw the wisdom of Solomon as well as the palace that he had built, all this food that was on the table, the seating of his officials and the entourage and how they all came in and, and just must have been one of them banquet tables that was, you know, longer than long. I mean, saw this, the attending servants in their robes, the cupbearers in their robes and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord. She was what? Overwhelmed. I mean, she was like, wow. I mean, she could hardly take it all in. She thought that she was the queen, and suddenly she's seeing what royalty is all about. I mean, I think most of us have probably been there. I mean, coming from Burnside, there have been several of those moments in my life going, whoa, I can tell where I'm at, and this is out of my league here, you know. Uh, country mouse comes to the city, you know. So she was overwhelmed. But, I mean, this wasn't a nobody. This is the Queen of Sheba, a well-known uh, lady in her own right. Well, she said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe what they said until I came and I saw with my own eyes. Indeed, and this is an amazing statement, not even half the greatness of your wisdom was told to me. 
You have far exceeded the report that I heard. Wow. I mean, and, and nothing against you ladies, but it's just really difficult for a guy to really impress a woman. But she was impressed. You know, I'm just blown away with this. She goes, not even half of the greatness of your wisdom. Man, it's so far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your men must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. So she connects the wealth thing along with the wisdom thing. The two things working together here. And it, it just overwhelms her. And she's going, it would be a joy to serve in your kingdom. This is what she's saying. These people that you've picked that are your servants must just be thrilled. Because they get to be around you all the time and hear this wisdom and all. You know, one of the stories that the Bible tells is about the two ladies that... Um, we're, we're fighting over this child, you know, and one was claiming it was hers, the other was saying, no, it's mine, and back and forth. And Solomon went ahead and listened to it, and it says that what he did next, he said, bring me the child, and get me a sword. And so they brought the child, and they got, gave him a sword, and Solomon stood up and said, now, each of you take a leg, and he's going to just chop this kid in half and give a half to each, each mother. He said, okay, I can't tell, so I'll just give it to each. And all of a sudden, this one mother screamed, you know, no, no, give it to her. Go ahead, just give it to her. And Solomon used that and he said, no, I'll give it to you because you're the true mother. See, that's wisdom. It's that type of, it's a knowledge, but it's not absolutely knowing everything, but it's a knowing enough to be able to bring what the solution should be. And so this is what the Queen of Sheba is overwhelmed with. And she goes, man, it must be so cool to be a servant in your palace. And I, I just think this is really, really neat to read. And then verse 8, notice this, that she even goes, and we don't know, she obviously, I don't believe, was a Jehovah believer, but maybe she'd heard about God. And apparently with Solomon's t teachings and explanations, she learned more about the real God or the, what the Jews, just like Christians today, proclaim, the one and the only God. As egotistical as that may sound, that's what the Bible teaches us. She said, praise be to the Lord your God who has delighted in you and placed you on his throne as a king to rule for the Lord your God. Now, see, she understood it. She got it that it wasn't just Solomon was here ruling, but it's Solomon, king of the Jews, king of the Israelites, this ruling because God appointed him and has placed this and brought this to him. She made the connection. Now, I share that with you because, see, that's the same connection that your friends and my friends and the people around us that we work with and that we come across in life, that's the same impression we ought to leave. Not necessarily because we're so wealthy or whatever, but how we handle our wealth. And the wealth that we have that's not the kind that you can put in a bank account. The wealth that's deep. The wisdom that God promises to every believer. The wisdom that God will give and flourish upon us. It's available to us. He doesn't expect us to knee-jerk reactions, go off our feelings, but rather instead to the depths of His wisdom we draw from and we apply to our life. And those that ask, we seek God to give them answers too. Not that we have an answer to everything like Solomon did, no. But at least we seek God on their behalf and we won't only say we'll pray for you, we pray with them as long as they'll let us. And in that regard, that they come to that conclusion about the Lord your God. Wow, look at what He's done for you and has appointed you. I think this is a huge evangelistic message. I mean, in a great, great way about how much when we do things for God and in His honor, what results? And it's that people begin to really believe instead of just casually believing. Instead of an awareness, it sinks into their heart. And so that's what she's doing. Praise be, verse 8 again, to the Lord your God who has delighted in you and placed you on his throne as king to rule the Lord your God, rule for the Lord your God. Because of the love of your God. So she even gets the love of God uh, for Israel and his desire to uphold them forever. He's made you king over them to maintain justice and righteousness. She gave the king 120 talents of gold. Now you jump on down in there and that says that's about four and a half tons. I'm glad you wowed because I'm going, whoa. At, you know, how many thousand, how many thousand dollars an ounce now? 1,200 at least, was up to 14. An ounce and she gave four and a half tons, 9,000 pounds of gold. So you already got your calculator, I'm figuring that out and say, wow, I just, yeah, being a preacher, I thought 10% of that would be, <laughs> wow, wow. Now, now, now go back and read, she came bearing these gifts and the spices and all these stuff and brought the, the stones, precious, I mean, <laughs> and what was it President Obama gave the Queen of England, a DVD of his favorite collections or something that way, you know, I mean, it's like, 
It doesn't compare. I mean, this is overwhelming. Four and a half tons of gold, but that wasn't all. I mean, but she, she gives him all this stuff. Um, I, I mean, I'm just blown away. So she gave the king 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices and precious stones. And the spices back then were a big deal. I mean, even, you know, the Roman government was who really kind of initiated this idea of a salary that we're used to getting. Not celery, that green stuff you can chew, gets in your teeth and stinks, you know. But it, it's salary. Um, because it comes from the word salt. And they used to pay their soldiers in salt because salt was desired more than gold. I mean, gold was nice if you could buy the salt with it, but they found out how great this was to have salt. And the spices were much the same way. And they weren't all over the world at the time. There's particular areas. Well, she, from her area, she brought these spices. And so it was a real tribute to Solomon. It was a real delight to him. But it shows how impressed she was. She had the stuff, but once she sees it all, she goes, man... Here is my gift of homage and amazement to you. I want to be, you know, a, uh, 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 I want to have a good relationship because I sure don't want to come up against you. I'm in favor of you. You know, let's have an alliance here together and everything in that regard. So uh, she brought these and the, she, the queen of Sheba, it says, gave them to King Solomon. Verse 10, the men of Hiram and the men of Solomon brought gold from Ophir. Not Oprah here, but Ophir. They also brought uh, algam wood and precious stones. The king used the algam wood to make steps for the temple of the Lord and the royal palace to make harps and lyres for the musicians. I never had to pay to get a lyre. Nothing like them had ever been seen in Judah. King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba all that she desired and asked for. He gave her more than she had brought to him and then she left and returned with her retinue to her own country. So, whoa. I mean, so she brings all this stuff and Solomon says gave her back more. And I guess when you're running those circles, it doesn't make any difference how many zeros you got, you know. It's just, you know, you're, you're doing this because he's saying, well, I'm impressed with you. And she goes, I'm really impressed with you. He goes, well, here, you know, let me bless you. And so it's kind of like they traded stuff that he had. He gave to her stuff she had. She gave to him. And, and all of it is because though she's overwhelmed. And I just think it's so cool that she came to this conclusion about how great his God was. What else? Well, it says, the weight of the gold, verse 13, that Solomon received yearly, was 666 talents. Ooh. Everybody know what that is, don't you? 666. It must be the mark of the beast. Unless it's in gold, then it's okay, right? Um, That's a bunch. I mean, I think if I'm looking right here, that was in in my footnotes. That's about 25 tons. Oh, my. The weight of the gold Solomon received annually was 25 tons. Now, I, my mind just can't wrap around that. I just can't imagine. When it says that he was the wealthiest man in the world, I mean, it was. And I believe personally that when God speaks that way, that he still is the wealthiest of all that have ever lived in comparison. Inflation taken and everything else. But 666 talents or 25 tons a year that these guys mined this gold and brought it to him. Wow. Wow not including the revenues brought in by merchants and traders. He had those taxes and those permits that they had to get to the shipping industry and all. Also, the kings of Arabia and the governors of the land brought gold and silver to Solomon. So on top of that, like, and you're like, well, if you got that much, how can you need more? But Solomon was just like us. We always want more. So King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. I mean, shields for his guys that protect the palace are made of gold. You can't, I mean, that's just beyond belief. He made 200 of these large shields. 600 beakers of hammered gold went into each shield. He also made 300 small shields of hammered gold with 300 beakers of gold in each one. The king put them in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. Then the king made a great throne inlaid with ivory and overlaid with pure gold. The throne had six steps and a footstool of gold was attached to it. So just that when he wanted to recline a little bit, they had the servants come up and flip the gold footstool down and he put his royal feet up on it, you know, to be comfortable there as he pontificated with all of his wisdom. On both sides of the seat were armrests with a lion standing beside each of them. Twelve lions stood on the six steps, one at either end of each step. Nothing like it had ever been made for any other kingdom. All King Solomon's goblets were gold. All the household articles in the palace of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. That's 24 carat. Nothing uh, was made of silver. (laughs) Isn't this hilarious? Nothing was made of silver because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's day. Wow. Wow. Like pennies. (laughs) Who cares, you know? Um, it was just, you know, nothing. The king had a fleet of trading ship manned by Hiram's men. Once every three years it returned carrying what? More gold, silver, ivory, 
apes and baboons. Now, whoa, I mean, I guess that was when you really arrived. You got your own apes and baboons. But I mean, this guy is a world... Tra- kind of funny, isn't it? It's like, I've always wanted my own pet monkey. Um, anyway, so they get these monkeys and baboons, apes, you know? And I'm like, what do you have, a jungle going on in there? And, you know, I just picture Tarzan and them swinging on the vines through the palace or whatever it is. But, but I mean, this is overwhelming. And what it shows is that he was a world traveler and that people wanted to give him stuff. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. All the kings of the earth sought audience with Solomon to hear their wisdom God had put in his heart. Wow. All of them. Everybody was so overwhelmed with what they heard about him that they sought this audience with him because it was just, they they had to see for themselves and hear for themselves. And they had their own questions like the Queen of Sheba had. And uh, they wanted to hear what God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift. Articles of silver and gold, robes, weapons and spices, horses and mules. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses. How many? 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. That means he had a lot of pitchforks. Uh, And 12,000 horses. Whoa! Which he kept in the chariot cities and also with them in Jerusalem. He ruled over all the kings from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the uh, foothills. Excuse me. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt huh? and from all other countries. As for the other events of Solomon's reign from beginning to end, are they not written in the record of Nathan the prophet, the prophecy of Ahijah the, the Shiloh knight, and in the visions of Edu or Idu, the uh, seer concerning Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Nebat. Sorry, my Bible's folded over there. Solomon reigned in Jerusalem all over all of Israel for 40 years. Then he rested with his father and was buried in the city of David, uh, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, succeeded in his king. Wow. Okay, just a little bit of history lesson. Now, why would I read all that? So that you would go back with me to the book of Luke. I mean, we've been looking at, and, and I really wanted to, but I can see now time is fleeting because we're having so much fun. I wanted, to, wanted you to see that. Because this same man, maybe, I mean, I know you just found Luke, but maybe we do need to go back to Ecclesiastes. I saw, it's, it's, we got a little bit here. Let's go back and just look again. We read this beginning of the year, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. But see, sometimes you read stuff, and I know sometimes when I'm reading stuff, you're thinking about other things, and you're checking your text messages, and you're, you're busy, because, you know, I mean, you're at church, so it's just like, come on, I know Steve's going to go for quite a while, and then I'll check, catch up at the end and get something out of it that's the way God works for you, that's good. And I'm not saying I want you to hang on every one of my words. I just want you not to miss his. And uh, certainly if as I'm reading and you want to go on, I mean, if God's leading you there, go on. But seek him. Because this book of Ecclesiastes is what this man with this wealth and this kind of homage being paid to him from all over the world, I mean, it would take a lot of wisdom of God not to get caught up and become egotistical, wouldn't it? I mean... When silver's like stones, can you imagine having a little chunk of silver, you know? I mean, in our day and age, you know, let's say it's a $100 silver piece, you know, whatever like that, and just going through the peasants going, here's a rock, here's a rock, you know? Just passing them out to people like no big deal. But I mean, when you look at this, Ecclesiastes, this is the richest man, this is the wisest man, and this is what he wrote. Chapter 1, the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Now, what? And and that's why I wanted to build this up for you. I want you to grasp because there's something inside of us that we just keep believing. If we just had more, more what? Well, if I'm just smarter, I could make more money. If I had more money, I could be smarter. And it's the dog chasing his tail. And even if you catch it, what are you going to get? You're going to bite yourself, you know? But we, we strive after these things. I mean, strive, stride. We take long leaps after them. We buy lottery tickets and yet we can't pay the bills. But man, but if I just hit the big one, you know, and I'm praying the whole time, so God will bless. And I'm just saying, this man had arrived by the blessing of God. He didn't hit the lottery. It was more than that. I mean, 25 tons of gold a year. This guy had to come up with new things to do. I mean, I can't imagine a shield really being of much, I mean, it was valuable, but not being worth much if I'm the one behind it. Because gold by itself is soft. And it wouldn't protect much. But it looked cool. And, I mean, having 12,000 horses, 
the Arabian and the Egyptian horses, the finest of fine, and people still bring you more and more stuff, and all you had to do was sit back and tell them about, yeah, here's how biology works, and here's how the plant life works, and here's how this works, and that. Because that's where we got most of the teaching that's going on today. It's from Solomon and what was written down. He delved into this because God illuminated his mind to be able to comprehend. But this is the guy that wrote, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all of his labor at which he toils under the sun? Why don't we want to answer that question? This wise man asked it and said he came to his conclusion. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. He missed out on that. God says, no, it won't. My word will remain forever, but this earth will be destroyed along with the heavens. The sun rises, the sun sets, and hurries back to where it rises. Now, I didn't go back into this like I'd wanted to into the Hebrew because I didn't have Hebrew in class, but I've got the books that I could do it with. But I thought, you know, different ones have claimed, well, the world is flat, the world is round. Well, it kind of gives this picture that he understood that. The sun rises and it sets, hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, every turning on its course. Gives again, not the idea of a flat level sheet or plane, but rather instead something round. It just keeps coming back around. Where's the wind come from? He said, all streams flow into the sea, but why is the sea never full? He couldn't answer that. To the place the streams come from, they return again. All things are wearisome. More than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing. The ear never has enough fill or its fill of hearing what has been will be again what has been done will be done again there's nothing new under the sun is there anything of which one can say look this is something new it might be new to you but not to somebody else it was already here long ago it was here before our time there's no remembrance of men of old and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that's done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. So as he looked at this, he goes, wow. You know, it seems a part of it that it's like overwhelming. It's a burden, you know. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are, once again, what does it say? Meaningless. Now, this is a guy with great wisdom that could answer all this lady's questions, everything she asked him, he could answer. But he said, when it comes right down to it, the rest of the stuff of life, it's just pretty meaningless. He said, a chasing after the wind. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What's lacking cannot be counted. So I thought to myself, look, I've grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of the wisdom, also the madness and the folly, and I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow or grief. More knowledge, the more grief. Man, as we accumulate this, we begin to see. I mean, what's that Internet doing for you? The World Wide Web. It just lets us know quicker about all that's happening everywhere. And then we find out we can't even believe Wikipedia. What's up with that? Because anybody can put in there what they think. And we have politicians been doing that for years, telling us what they think. And we think that they know what they're talking about. They just know how to talk. Preachers can be the same way. That's why I want you to read and I want you to see and I want you to come to your own conclusions. I'm just here to tell you that, man, according to the Word of God and even the people that met Solomon, they said that he was the wisest man they'd ever been around. And it's obvious if he had close to that, nobody refuted it. This stuff, this overwhelming, impressive kingdom of his... And yet he's the one saying it's all meaningless. And the rest of the book deals with this meaningless part of that. And that's why I think it's healthy for us today in our day and age to read it. Because this guy had it all and still admitted. He goes, but something's still missing. Something's still missing. And the bottom line is what's amazing about it is he gets to the end of it. And, but it goes through and talks about the gardens he built. And he built aqueducts and one thing and another like that. And, and at the end of it all he's still saying, but so What? It was good for a moment, but now it's just there. It's got to be maintained. I've got 12,000 horses, but somebody's got to clean the stalls. Then I've got to get more people to get more hay to feed them. Then I've got to get this, and I've got to get that, and then I need chariots for those horses, you see? And we mostly understand, don't we? I mean, when Julie and I started out, we, we looked at the housing in the area and one thing like that, and... For us at the time, it was better off us. We bought a trailer and pulled it onto the church property. 
They'd never had a full-time preacher. And we were content. Was that all we wanted? No, but it was all that we needed. And we enjoyed things until we saw other things that people had. And I remember the first time that I saw, and you guys are going to really go, what? You know those great big CDs that your parents got? (laughs) No, I remember the first time that somebody got a VCR. Now, some of you are old enough, you get that, yeah. But somebody bought a Curtis Mathis VCR that was like this. It was, you know, one of those console TVs, real nice, a 25-inch console TV. And this thing was nearly as big as that whole TV. Not as thick, but it was nearly as wide. But I mean, about that thick. And a button and this thing would come up out of there and you could put this tape into it and go back in and you could watch a movie without commercials. Better than Disney. Yeah, I know, I mean. But what I'm telling you is the stuff you guys have got today, somebody's going to be looking at you five years from now and going, oh yeah, you think that's hot? I mean, how many of us have cell phones that are already outdated because there's a better one out? I mean, we just keep going and going and I want one that will do everything. And then we... We almost take pride in being, oh, I'm so busy. I mean, everybody, nobody, no, nobody will leave me alone. Look, you set it up for them to be able to get you wherever you're at. <laughs> so you could turn around. I mean, no wonder he goes, man, it's a chasing your tail. It's a chasing the wind. It's all meaningless. And it is. But we believe it. We can be free if we get to the point we admit that the Bible knows what it's talking about. We can be free if we'll listen to the guy that had it all that we could never attain. I don't care how many lotteries you hit, you'll never be as wealthy as Solomon. You'll never do all the things that he did. And let alone with the hand of God and be in a way that people would see God through you. No matter how many promises you make, God, you do this and I'll use it for you. Well, let me ask you, when was the last time you used any one of your cars? I said plural because most of us have more than one. When was the last time any of you used any of your cars to take somebody that you didn't know someplace? When was the last time that you invited somebody you didn't know into your home? Because Jesus in the book of Luke, that's what he encouraged people to do. He encouraged them, he said, don't invite your friends and people that can pay you back. He said, man, invite somebody that can never pay you back because I'll pay you back at the resurrection. But we don't even trust God enough to believe that he means what he says, do we? Because, well, this day and age, Jesus didn't know what it was going to be like. I mean, somebody could rob us and kill us. And that's what we say, right? Chris is already saying it. That's why Joe laughed. She goes, I couldn't do that, you know. (laughs) And yet we'll tell everybody. Was I right? And we'll tell everybody, but all I've got is God, as a good Christian would say. All I've got is God's. I know God gave it to me and it's God's. But God, don't take it away. Because it's mine. I paid for it. But by the way, can you help me pay, since I was paying for this stuff, can you help me pay the stuff I really need, like food and get to work? I mean, isn't it weird? And we've got a couple, and I've mentioned on Wednesday night, we've got a couple here that, man, it was so cool. When they opened up their home at Christmas time to some of the homeless that we've met. Christmas Day, not just around it. I mean, we're talking December 25th. They come to church. They leave here. Had planned lunch out. Had it ready. Had to get out of the oven. Went by, picked those folks up, and took them to their house. And they said, bring your clothes, your dirty clothes. I've got a washing machine you can use. I've got a shower if you want. You guys can take showers today. And they said it was the merriest Christmas they ever had. Why? Why? Because God knows what he's talking about. And Solomon recognized it after experiencing everything. 300 wives and 700 concubines or something to that weird effect. 1,000 women at his disposal and it was meaningless too. I share that with you now to go to Luke. And I wanted to show you that passage I already told you about in Luke, but let's go to another one. Luke chapter 11. While you're turning there, let me see if I can find that one in here in chapter 14. You know, when I'm going to read from 14 while you find 11, okay? In chapter 14, it says, When he noticed, Jesus noticed how the guests picked the place of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, don't take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say, uh, Excuse me, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you'll have to take the, the least seat, or take the least important place. Instead, or when you're invited, 
take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he'll have to say to you, hey, friend, come on, move up here to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. And Jesus gives us this axiom. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, that's not Steve and his wisdom. That's Jesus and direct teaching. This is also reiterated by James and Peter. Everybody that exalts himself will be what? Humbled. When we strive, we'll be humbled. But when we humble ourselves, we're promised by God that he will exalt us. He'll lift us up. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. This is before political correctness. But we get the picture, right? Invite the poor and the crippled, the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, Jesus says, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, over here in chapter 11. You found it by now, didn't you? All right. In verse 29, Luke 11, 29. That's so funny because... I got to read 27. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother that gave you birth and nursed you. I'm glad nobody's ever interrupted my sermon saying that. I, <laughs> okay, if you say so, but I don't like to even think about that, you know. But I mean, everybody makes so much out of it. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I understand and Mary was the one that God used, but Jesus never did what we've done to her. And so he replied blessed rather he says oh you think so let me tell you the truth more blessed are those who hear the word of god and what obey it so today if you hear and you obey not my word but the word of god you're what blessed more blessed than mother mary that's what god said as the crowds increased jesus said this is a wicked generation i've loved this the crowds are growing a preacher's delight and so what he does he thins out the crowd by going this is a wicked generation Man, I mean, that's amazing, isn't it? He wasn't afraid. It asked for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. Oh, did you get that? After talking about Joseph, back, or Jonah, excuse me, back, back up. The Queen of the South will rise at what? The judgment day. The queen of Sheba is presumed here, the queen of the south. She'll rise at the judgment with the men of this generation, speaking when Jesus, but I think it carries on into us. Those of us that know God and know about God and have the word of God and do nothing with it, we, don't, we may even kind of listen to it, but we don't obey it. She said, the queen of south, the queen of Sheba will rise at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. She'll be the one that will stand up because what did she say after she saw Solomon all of his splendor? Oh, your God, not oh my God, no, your God, the Lord, your God is an amazing God. And, and especially that we bestow all this on you and let us see and how blessed those servants are that get to listen to this wisdom. She saw God in it. And man, I'm afraid today we celebrate celebrities and we celebrate sports figures and we celebrate whatever else it would be. And oh yeah, I got to go to church today. I mean, if I had free concert tickets, race tickets, whatever tickets it is that you like to do, season tickets for the Braves, and I said, anybody that wants to come up here and get them, I've got them right here, I'll just be glad to give them to you. I would say, there'd be three or four of you that run up. Because, man, tickets to the Braves. But if I said, I've got tickets, free tickets to church every Sunday for the rest of the year, there wouldn't be a person stand up. <sighs> I can do that anyway. But you see, our value system... What we think is worth something, what we think is worth less. What we honor, what we dishonor. And I don't bring that up to condemn. Instead, what I just want you to know is that's what Jesus was trying to get across to them. These people were religious. They believed in God. Just like you, just like me. But Christ is saying it's not enough just to believe. But real belief will do something with it. We'll hear and we'll obey. The queen of Sheba, she went out of her way and brought gifts with her to come to a man of God. What do we do? We can come directly to the Son of God and we don't come. And that's my message today is why. 
We'd be impressed if Solomon was here and I'm afraid if Jesus showed up, we wouldn't recognize him. Because we're not geared that way. Satan has so given us the bait and we swallowed it whole that we, we are insatiable when it comes to wanting, 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 wanting. And the whole time Jesus goes, and I want you. I just want you. And like the rich young ruler, I don't even care if you got stuff. I just want you. And he puts out his arms this wide and he dies on the cross saying, I want you. And we struggle to embrace that. No wonder it's hard for us to dare talk to our friends and say, do you know Jesus? Here's what I've learned about him. And you don't quote facts and figures. You tell about how he changed your heart. And you show it with your lifestyle. Then so they come away going, oh, you serve the greatest God. The people that work with you must be delighted. So that's the message today. Jesus says that the queen's going to rise up at the judgment day. And by her own testimony of words, she said back then, not even knowing what Jesus was going to do. But then Jesus says of himself, and someone greater than Solomon is here. And that's so uncanny, because Jesus was so humble. He was not self-exalting. But it, met to, it got to the point that the two had to hit head on. And he's saying, what you're impressed with isn't impressive to God. And he said, I'm telling you, I came. He came of his own. He came in honor of God. And he came for you and me. And we still don't have time for him. We still don't have room for him. There's still no room in the inn. Because we've got stuff we've got to do. Because there's a new cell phone out I've got to have. And we never once do even what the Queen of Sheba did, who turned around and was so overwhelmed she gave gifts. And I think it's a cool parallel because... Solomon wasn't God, but God, as Jesus said, when you give gifts to others, God says, I saw that, and I'll give it back in the world to come. But you see, that's why Christianity is so different than all the religions. It's about not indulging here, but it's about getting to indulge later on. It's about the wealth of the riches of the kingdom of God that gold can't touch. Because in heaven... Remember Solomon's kingdom? What did it say? Silver was like stones, meaning we could pave our driveways with it. Guess what heaven's paid with? Gold. Why? Because there's no big deal. Because to God it's worthless. It's just driveway material. But man, when it comes to his son, I can't wait. When God reveals, this is the one that died for you. This is the one that made you all those sons of men and wicked like David made you the sons of God. This is the one that will see you through everything. This is the one you can count on because look what he did for you. He became poor so that you might become rich. But we've got to change our value system or we'll miss it. Henry, if you will, come on up. It's that time when we stop and we reflect now. They sing a song and we can join with and sing the song too. And sometimes that's a very healthy thing to do. It's a time when we can stand or we can stay seated. We can come up and we can kneel. We can be alone. We can get somebody else. It's a time when we can waste. Because we can look and go, oh man, I wish you'd have quit 10 minutes ago. Yeah, I know that happens. I've been in those services before too. But I know one day I'm going to have to stand before him and I know that I've got to answer for what I did and I never want to run somebody off or overindulge but at the same time man, I didn't want you to meet, miss the drama if the Queen of Sheba saw something in him Jesus said what do you see in me and he's opened up his wisdom to all of us as well as his heart and his life and poured out his blood for us to pay for our sins so that we could have access to the Father through him man oh man how cool you are, Jesus. So during this psalm, let you respond. Not to me, to God. Let's stand and respond or sit and respond, whatever, okay?